Hello, everybody, and welcome to our second Samba Digital webinar. After the success of our first on sports betting in Brazil with Bet Chris, we want to build upon that. And I have to follow Fred after his impeccable hosting of that session. So, no pressure there then today. My name is Dan McLean. I'm key account manager here at Samba, looking after some of our attendees here today. So, thank you for taking the time to tune in. And also, today's guest organization, Orlando Magic. After the remarkable NBA bubble in their home state of Florida over the summer, they have just come away from last week's NBA draft and are looking forward to a new season that starts in a month's time, the 22nd of December. Jeff Kramer is the head of live entertainment and production at Magic, and I'm looking forward to diving into all three of these areas in the time we've got today. Before we get started, though, there's, there is a Q&A section on this webinar, so please put down any questions you think of during our talk. And at the end, we'll have 10 minutes or so to ask as many of them as we can to Jeff. So after my intro, I'll pass over to Jeff for a quick presentation. Then I'll be firing some questions at him for about 20 minutes. Then it's your time. But for now, let's start with a quick intro to Samba Digital and get into today's topic. For those of you who may not know that much about us, Samba is an international sports and entertainment agency. We offer a global marketing service that includes social media management, content and creative production, PR and monetization. Today, we cover about 10 different markets with huge experience in the Americas. Here are some of the examples of our clients. We help football clubs, leagues, federations, other sports like rugby, cycling, tennis, and also betting companies to grow in international markets on digital. So where does Samba operate? We have a huge experience in the Americas, so LATAM and US. We also help our clients in several of the markets like Europe, MENA, and Asia through our partnership with 2108, a Chinese sports marketing agency. Today's focus is, of course, on the US. I just wanted to highlight a couple of examples of the work we've done over there, including this example where we worked on a preseason tour in the US, when you could do such things, of course. Um, with the EA League One games, working on the ground to create video and PR activities during the trip. Another activation was this preseason tour with VFL Wolfsburg during the Florida Cup, linking, linking nicely into the location of today's guest. And finally, a competition that led to three American fans being invited to the Bundesliga game between Wolfsburg and FC Bayern. Right. Now it's time for the main event. I'm going to hand over to Jeff, who will take us through their use of digital during the summer's NBA bubble. Over to you, Jeff. All right. Thanks, Dan. And, and thank you for having me and for everyone attending. I think, you know, before I share a little bit of information, I just uh, probably worth it to, to say thank you to the, the team for all your work um, with us. It's been a, it's been a great relationship um, so far to this point. Um, and we're, very, very excited on, on building on that for this coming season and, and years to come. So um, kudos to the team and, and can give you a little bit of an introduction. Um, as, as Dan said, my name is Jeff Kramer. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Live Entertainment and Production here at The Magic. Um, it, you know, it's somewhat of a unique role um, in that I'm overseeing our entertainment. Um, here at home games, but also our content production um, and our social media strategy. Uh, this is my 15th season with the team and by far the most uh, unique and stressful season. Uh, my general role is to oversee our content studio, uh, which is a team of 18 producers, editors, videographers, photographers, and graphic designers. Um, and help translate that into a successful um, social media strategy, um, as well as supporting our local uh, sports network and our in-game entertainment. Now, I uh, can share a little bit of, of an introduction to our bubble experience. And, and one of the first things we learned uh, about the NBA campus experience was that it would be held at, at Disney's wide world of sports here at Disney. Um, and after we quickly learned um, that we would only be allocated one position uh, within the, the bubble for content capture. And like many teams, uh, we pushed back. We very much tried to play the uh, 
card that we're local and we can just send people down every day. Uh, but unfortunately, and due to the nature of how the NBA um, designed the campus and, and the environment, um, our content representative would, would have to be embedded within the bubble, um, even though he lived 15 miles down the street. Um, he had to stay on property, adhere to the same health and safety protocols uh, as the rest of those on campus. Uh, so with that information, uh, we had to quickly determine who was the best uh, representative to send and, and to maximize our opportunities at Disney. And um, in doing so, you know, we prioritized our needs um, that, that we felt we needed to deliver uh, from a content perspective um, to del deliver on our partnerships. And we landed on um, a rough breakdown of how we were prioritizing uh, the content for all of our needs. Um, and our breakdown was essentially, we needed a producer. Uh, we need, we're focused on an editor, a videographer, a photographer, and someone that can handle social media on the fly. And, and luckily for us, we do have a jack of all trades um, on our team, someone that's we were able to lean on um, and and be willing to leave his family, um, quite honestly, for two and a half months, and work um, around the clock in the bubble, and and we landed there knowing we were going to fall short on a lot of the content um, that we're used to having in our in our home venue um, or being on the road, um, and you know a lot of the information. Um, did come slowly for us. Uh, the NBA really did a phenomenal job of setting teams up for success, and there aren't enough positive things um, that I'd be able to to be said for uh, the work that they did to stand up the season. Um, but with with all of that, we did still have um, some challenges, which were probably no different than than a lot of people on this call you know a lot of um the way that that we've all worked has uh been severely affected by uh this pandemic and you know we had had started um to change the way we were working um and so the bubble was just the next step for us and and one of the most significant challenges um for us was trying to determine our content plans, um, not knowing a lot of the key information. Some of the things like when, uh, when was the team actually going down to the bubble? Um, how much of the process are we going to be able to show? Uh, can we show the players um, traveling to Disney, arriving at Disney? Um, are we, um, how are we ensuring that the content that we're outputting um, showcases some of the health and safety guidelines that are in place um, and, and really trying to understand how we're going to be able to do this um, with one person on site. So uh, we, we typically try to plan our content about one to two months out at a time. And so, you know, for those of you that, that may not be aware, the, the bubble came together very quickly. Um, and so we had had basically planned out uh, through August um, our our content strategy and our content plan, and it was very much a traditional um, off season plan. But when we got word that that we were headed down, we quickly um, flipped and tried to maximize what we know. So our team went down uh, the first week of July. And uh, we knew that that basketball would be returning at the end of July. So we we did the best um, planning that we could, and we had our schedule. And then we just immediately reevaluated our content plans and shifted to basketball is back. Um, we, you know, it was a unique time. We didn't want to be too celebratory, but it was exciting that we were coming back. And our content strategy went from entertaining and reminding fans in the off season why it's great to be a Magic fan or an NBA fan to trying to re-energize our fan base um, and get fans excited and reinvigorated for coming back to basketball. Um, 
you know, with the goal of providing as much of an inside story as we could uh, about the scale of the effort put into the bubble and lifting this up. So we made some assumptions early. Uh, one of those was that Disney um, is one of our biggest uh, partners, as you can probably tell by the uh, patch on our uniform. And while we started to plan, we quickly uh, tried to leverage our partnerships team and our relationship with Disney to create some sort of unique and, and uh, behind the scenes opportunities and, and access. And unfortunately, uh, some of the challenges we were going through with lifting up the season, um, Disney was going through those as well with the league. So we weren't necessarily afforded um, truly unique um, opportunities that, that given a little more lead time, we may have been able to do. Um, but that was just a, uh, another reason where, um, we were able to step back, reevaluate and really, um, try to look for new opportunities, um, to keep people entertained. Um, and as information was coming, uh, in for things happening on campus, um, you know, we, we would just shift and, and make changes on the fly. Um, you know, we manage our production um, via Microsoft Teams uh, before, the, before we were all left the office. And, and the team's mobile technology was really uh, the tool that kept us up to speed and working um, in this unique situation. Um, something we could certainly share more of um, down the road or any questions later. But as it relates to uh, content sharing and production, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, the NBA has some great tools um, that they make available to e each team um, to access content remotely. And one of the big questions we had going in was, without the infrastructure of each team's home arena, would the NBA still be able to have the connectivity, the bandwidth to maintain their level of support to teams at Disney? And I think the easiest thing would be for me to give a probably a brief overview of some of the ways we were able to acquire content with one uh, production team member on site. Um, while we were there, our producer captured over two terabytes of, of video. And our original plan was for him to edit any of the footage that required um, immediate needs and, and FTP back uh, footage to our team of editors um, back working at home or, or the arena. And while that plan worked very well in our heads, um, it was just too much uh, data daily to transfer. Um, and it ended up being more troublesome than it was worth. So uh, we're able to deliver some content uh, timely, but we took um, a quick pivot and started to lean a little bit harder on what the NBA was providing to teams. So our main sources of content in the bubble were the offsite capture, or the onsite capture, I'm sorry, uh, with our producer, NBA's digital media archive, um, game highlights, NBA entertainment content. So NBA entertainment content is things that the league um, and their group of producers are, are capturing um, at the league level and sharing with all the teams. Um, some of the Phantom Canon footage, uh, images from the photographers, and content we were able to secure from our sports uh, network. Uh, so we, we really relied heavily on a conversation with our on-site producer. Um, with, with the shift, he would lay out rough edits, um, send them back to the team, who would then layer in additional assets we were able to secure from the NBA. So he's effectively doing offline edits um, on-site and sending them back to their team. Um, and then it's probably also worth noting that the NBA has a project management platform uh, that was used to update users throughout the day, uh, which would uh, provide a uh, level of information as far as uh, practices, media call times, if players were going off to play golf, uh, what the NBA was capturing. So we would know in real time what we could rely on the NBA for and what it would be beneficial for our producer to cover. Um, so while it was frustrating, 
uh, and challenging for us. It was, it was obviously rewarding um, to be able to bring some of the NBA season back, deliver content to our fans. Um, you know, we went into it with strong, strong plans. Um, we called regular audibles and adapted um, in the best way that we could. Um, and, you know, with that, uh, probably transitioned to, to some questions to help shed a little more light because, um, you know, plenty happened um, on site and it's, um, it was certainly uh, an opportunity that, that we were glad uh, the NBA led and, and we were able to, to uh, bring basketball back to our fans. Thanks, Jeff. I mean, uh, I think there's going to be lots of questions coming off the back of that. Um, so much we can dig into, but um, just to start with, I mean, obviously you've got the producer on site, you've got the rest of the team at home, basically, and mm -hmm. uh, elsewhere. How did you make sure that the rest of the team had everything that they needed as well to support what was happening um, within the bubble? Sure. So what's interesting is that was very much um, the the overall challenge that we've been dealing with even outside of the bubble is just making sure i think for anybody that that works with video um you know that that our files are huge and it's it's not quite as easy uh to work remotely we have uh quite an infrastructure um built up in the arena um so so getting that content disseminated to the rest of our team um, was a challenge. And when we went to the bubble, we ended up um, setting up some automation to deliver content. So um, we have uh, a content manager on our team that was able to help us coordinate um, needed assets and deliver them directly to our editors and producers that were going to be working on things. Um, you know, the, the greatest challenge is just all the pressure we were putting on our our on-site producer to, mm. you know, luckily for us, he's, he, he loves production in general. So he doesn't have a problem staying um, at his computer till 2 a.m. and sending us things. It's, it's but a hell of that, a one to ask for someone to do, isn't it? Yeah. Away there, for two and there, a half months, not see anyone else, just being doing this, working 20 hour days. Yes. It's, you know, it's something that, you know, I don't think many people could have done. I don't think many people could have accomplished that. And luckily for us, we we had someone that that truly embraced it. And that's one of the reasons we were able to be more successful. Did you collaborate? I imagine this brought, must have brought kind of the teams and everyone together a little bit more than usual. Was there a lot of collabor collaboration going on between the different teams who are in the bubble? Yeah, you know, from a, from a content sharing perspective, there wasn't what was fascinating uh for me to see unfold and it it happened both with the production team and um we had a group of of game presentation um producers that were there putting on the i'll call it fan experience but putting on the music and the prompts and the video boards so what what i saw a lot of was just uh because every team uh valued a different skill set in, in the person that they were sending down there. Um, there were just a lot of conversations and collaboration and, and ours, like I mentioned earlier, we were looking for somebody first and foremost, that was a strong producer. Um, but he spent a lot of time talking to, to um, the, the content producers at the rockets, the heat, and just asking them questions about their equipment and understanding why their choices for equipment were working for them and how um, some of the things that he learned just by having conversations with some of those other guys helped um, helped the quality of our our content capture and, and what we're doing long term so that that was more of the collaboration than anything yeah and when you were going through the competition obviously you probably had you had a plan in your mind as how it's going to work and the content you were going to capture Mm -hmm. Did the, the kind of content that worked and you actually lent on more, did that change throughout that period? Yeah, we actually saw um, the, the user response to our content was, was very much an ebb and flow. Early it was um, fans engaging with and being excited for 
a lot of the on-court play. I think because our season was initially cut short, a lot of people were quick to um, jump on. All right, we have live sports. We're excited about sports. And then as games continued, we saw a rise in interest in uh, a lot of the off the court content. So whether our players uh, were golfing, uh, fishing, doing, uh, the guys went bowling, some of the things that they were doing on site um, were, were the things that ended up shifting. And then as we entered the playoffs, it, it kind of transitioned back to basketball. Cool. Um, hopefully my microphone's working okay. Uh, someone just said that it's quite hard to hear me. So hopefully it's, I'll go a little bit closer to the microphone, see if that works. Um, one thing around the hometown fans, because obviously you're in Florida, the bubble's in Florida, you're in Florida, your fans are in Florida. Was there a way in which you could kind of connect with those hometown fans and try and build upon that home advantage? Yeah, so this was definitely interesting um, for us, you know, with the, the health, health and safety protocols that the league office had in place, um, you know, it was almost as if we weren't even in Orlando. Um, our strategy was very much to do what other teams were doing and, and deliver as much content to fans and focus the best we could um, at off the court content, uh, like I just talked about. And at the end of the day, um, you know, we weren't necessarily able to deliver a home court advantage. Some of the advantage though that we had was because of our proximity to the bubble. We sent, um, we have two playing courts. So we sent both of those to be um, courts for the, the practice facilities that they set up in, in hotel ballrooms. So we got additional exposure, you know, that when the Lakers are practicing on our court, at least they're taking pictures, you know, the Lakers have, massive following um so that was a little bit more of the advantage uh having having um other teams tagging location uh, having us be able to tag the location i think the opportunity that we saw was was trying to trying to jump into people's explore feed and and to find opportunities um for people to find us just given that the bubble was here you know we we made an effort to to go out and try to engage um with more content that wasn't necessarily our owned content um but un unfortunately every team was created the same and we didn't <laughs> we didn't get some of the benefits we were hoping for with this being in our backyard was it quite hard to stand out then was every as you say everyone's doing kind of roughly the same thing did you have to think oh how can we do things a little bit differently how can we take it up a yeah little? Yeah, and that, that was quite honestly the challenge is everybody had the same guidelines, protocols, everything. Um, so, so really um, taking it up a level was, was very much tied to on-court performance. And, you know, we, we had a uh, unique situation for those of you that, that may not know. Our, it was our game with the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, that was that the Bucks initially decided to um, the, the racial injustice um, that we were um, so involved with as a league. And, you know, that was one of uh, the things happened in the bubble that that did um, bring a lot of additional exposure. Um, to us and, and, you know, obviously an important message for, for the league, our organization um, and the players. Um, but beyond that, it was, it was very much um, on court play and trying to, to maximize the volume of content we were able to capture. It definitely moves us on to a theme that someone's actually asked a question about, and I was going to bring up as well in terms of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement that was obviously huge during the summer. And how did you kind of weave that into your social media communications being such kind of sensitive subject and also kind of the guidelines that you had or the NBA had? Yeah, I, I would say that um, there, were, there were no true 
guidelines put in place. Um, you know, the league and the players met and agreed on a handful of um, phrases uh, that could be put on the jersey, and and we were highlighting those. But you know, this was um, not only an issue that was important to our players, uh, but our organization and our fans. And you know, we uh, had an opportunity and a platform to highlight um, the social and racial injustice. And you know, it wasn't it wasn't about our strategy uh, to boost our numbers. It was about getting the right message out there. Um, and ensuring that we were doing everything um, we could to amplify uh, that message on our channels. So we produced a handful of PSAs. We um, met with the players um, remotely, uh, even prior to going into the bubble, and um, work to um, kind of cultivate um, a message that, that we wanted as a team and organization and you know our um, our digital team put together a resource website um, tied to racial injustice, where um, there would be a handful of uh, key information, voting information, and and a lot of what we did digitally um, was to uh, inform and and educate, and that was really the goal of that content. It wasn't that was almost a step removed from what our traditional goals of impressions, engagements, and all of that. We were, we were trying to educate and, and inform. Yeah. It's, just, it's always one of those hard areas, you know, if you're working, especially in social media, you know, this year we've had, how do you communicate around COVID around mm-hmm. BLM and in the U S with the um, U S election as well, you know, uh, traditionally people have steered away from especially political um, discussions. So how do, how do you navigate your way through all the all these different um, different things that are happening? So, you know, our we we put together a, a voting campaign. So our players actually um, arrived at Disney wearing shirts that said, um, "Get off the bench, get into the game, vote." So you know, we really uh, we really embraced that message and. Um, very similar to uh, the Black Lives Matter, we focused on just getting information out there. You know, it's, you're right, it's not something that that is frequently touched here in the States. And, you know, we certainly did not want to push, um, push people in any one direction. We just wanted to inform. So we wanted to um, remind people when they had to register to vote. We wanted to tell people how to vote. We wanted to tell people, um, or uh, I'm sorry, how they could vote or where they could vote. And, and so very much um, just about informing, educating, and providing resources, um, not necessarily focused on our, our uh, digital goals, if you will. Yeah, almost a step away and also being kind of apolitical as well. So you're not kind of yeah. seen as being one side or the other. You're just kind of encouraging people to vote rather than which side to vote. Correct. Yes. <laughs> cool. Um, one question that came up was, um, was someone's interest in going back to the NBA content sharing network. Mm-hmm. Can you share more details on what, what that was? And did the league have kind of generalist producers? Yes. So, so our content sharing network that the league has kind of um, comes in two parts. So it's very much tied to a high speed network that we have at each venue. And the league provides a massive database um, that, that all teams have access to, to um, download highlights, features, um, sound. And so there's, it's, it's broken into two parts. One is primarily the, the long-term archival solution that is, that is keeping, um, highlights. So that is updated, um, with incredible speed. We're able to generate playlists and, um, and request content, the league and 
whatever their automation is on the back end, takes our playlist and delivers it um, to our on-site network, which we then uh, transcode um, and, and place um, where we need to store it or ingest into our, um, our media um, and asset management system. And they also have a content network that, that shares the more um, featured pieces. So mixed edits, um, this would be top 10 plays across the league, um, some of the features produced on specific players. And that is um, content that the NBA um, entertainment producers, uh, I, I believe their final numbers were six um, producers and videographers on site that were just like our team. They were running all over the bubble, um, supporting the league and, and helping to support the teams. And this all, um, this all ties back to the, um, what the NBA calls assignment desk. It's the um, content management platform. So the NBA is regularly plugging in um, what shoots are upcoming, where the content lives, when it's been delivered to the asset system. And, and you know, it's a tremendous tool for, for all of us, especially when we only had one person that could be in, in one place. Another really interesting question that's coming from Rob Kelly um, is asked about some of the benefits of being part of that bubble. So the producer who was there for two and a half months, did that help to build stronger relationships with the players and other teams? Absolutely. Um, so I would tell you, if, if you asked him that question, he would say the benefit is he never had to cook for two and a half months. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the benefit, it, he was already a strong producer. It definitely helped the relationship with the players. We, we've made a lot of uh, changes. We've, we've done things differently um, over the last couple of years. And, and because we've had um, moderate turnover with our team, um, we haven't had that opportunity, but, you know, he was able to just jump on a pontoon boat with, um, three of the players going out or they were telling him they were going fishing things, you know, we're not normally getting, I think what we learn and which many others, um, are probably very aware is athletes enjoy having content of themselves and the more they're comfortable with us, um, the greater the benefit we saw. So, um, I would say the, the relationship with the players and, basketball management was was probably the the greatest benefit from from being embedded in there um you know the the challenge is now um you know our our producer spent two and a half months with them and now when they when we ask for somebody they say oh just send him well we have other people that that may be <laughs> suited better given the circumstances so um, that has been a little bit of a challenge, but a lot of his relationship, um, relationships he was able to, to build with some of the other teams down there really just helped us from a technical side and helped him grow technically, um, in there because it, it, it just took us outside of our normal, uh, workflow. Is that going to change the way you look at say going into next season, you know, what you can do with the players, how can you can utilize these relationships? Yeah, I mean, we're we're still very much um, trying to understand and, and figure out what this next season looks like for us. Um, you know, health and safety will continue to be uh, a primary area of focus um, for teams, for the league. And, and as we determine how we navigate that, I think um, having I, Jason, Jason was our content producer, probably could have said that earlier so i don't need to always refer to him as our content guy jason um you know will be able to uh lean on those relationships and and depending on the the structure of how we return safely with players i think he's most likely going to um be further integrated in with the team and and hopefully you know our goal is to travel him with the team assuming 
um, all the right protocols are in place to keep everyone um, safe is we would like to extend the um, the framework of the bubble to be over the course of the entire season. Cool. I want to move into slightly into a more international feel. Sure. Um, this kind of covers one we've always we've had from Eduardo Estevez from NKT Sportivo, and also Andy from Andy McKenzie from Livewire. Um, Eduardo is asking, kind of, with this uncertain future in kind of real relation to the pandemic, the presence yeah. of the public at matches and even international trips. How do you seek to differentiate yourself from digital to keep the foreign fan base? engaged in consuming? Sure, that's that's an excellent question. I, I would say that um, as we go into this season um, and as we better understand what our player access is, you know, that's, that's top of mind and that's where um, we're very much leaning on, on the team here at Samba to help us drive that and push us and, you know, we, uh, before um, we started, Dan and I were talking about um, some of our early player access and what that looks like. And, and we are limited, um, at least initially going into the season. So, um, you know, relying on, on this team to push us to capture unique content, especially for the, the Brazilian market right now is, is important. And then just trying to understand um, what opportunities and how creative we can get um, to have even small wins in other markets. You know, it, it is a struggle um, not having those international games and not having that exposure. Um, but that's why um, we're working, you know, with Samba is, is this is the team that helps us um, better understand how we can connect to, to fans internationally, what resonates, what um, we can look to be doing. Um, so no pressure guys, but we're, <laughs> we're going to continue to rely on you all for this. We're more than happy to do so. Um, in Andy's question, he was talking a little bit more about if we've seen any kind of general growth in international audiences and then, and if there've been any particular markets, cause obviously the tr strategy's probably changed during the summer to a normal season. And has that sure. reflected in seeing some slightly different changes as well in the audience? Yeah. So, you know, we can we continue to see um, steady growth in, in the Brazilian market. Um, and again, largely due to the efforts of, of this relationship. Um, internationally though, you know, for, for us, we're, we're a little bit unique in, in the sense that under normal circumstances, we um, see significant um, tourism from, uh, from Brazil, UK, um, Australia, and Germany. And we're able to lean heavily on what the game experience is. And when fans um, come in, they're likely to share uh, the game experience. And, you know, that's something that, that we're definitely missing um, and we're working to bring back. So a lot of, um, what we'll be doing when we do come back is highlighting some of the um, experiences so that when we um, have come to, um, whether it's an end or, or the next phase of, of all of us dealing with this pandemic and we do fill buildings again, um, how we can keep fans excited um, to come back. I think we found that, that a lot of people that do come on site um, are they are converted to fans, and I think we have a lot of opportunities internationally. For us, um, it's it's going to be a matter of um, building that content right now. And and I'd tell you, our in addition to our, our focus in in South America, um, we're also spending uh, some time and effort um, into um, China and Japan specifically, we've seen growth over there. Um, a lot of that content tied to our more historic um, moments. So a lot of the Shaq, Penny and, and Tracy McGrady days um, that we're leaning into, but we've we found, especially in Asia, that that's a lot of the content that's resonating over there and, and something we're leaning 
uh, more heavily into. So. Cool. I've got an excellent question from Matt Taylor that's just come in as well. Um, can you talk around your alternative methods for capturing data and fan insight, given the absence of game day crowds over the course of the pandemic? Great question. <laughs> so we, we do it in uh, a few methods. So we have a business strategy team um, that is, is routinely um, collecting data on fans and understanding um, what they want to see, more, more so tied to um, ticket buyers or prospective ticket buyers. I think what we do digitally um, is, is largely uh, going to be tied to, to three things. One being social listening. So this is, um, we have a platform that's actively listening to anytime our players are mentioned, our team is mentioned, Orlando, um, and really just understanding what the conversation around our team in the NBA is. And, and that's something we're looking through regularly to just hear, um, you know, it quite honestly tells us which players people care about or, um, what the sentiment around our different uniforms are. We've, we've gotten it down to the point where we know if we're wearing a certain uniform that we're going to um, see a lot more engagement because people tend to um, comment simply on what we're wearing that game. Um, and the other tool being um, when we return to basketball, we introduced a uh, very unique uh, second screen uh, platform. So it's, we effectively did predictive gaming um, to coincide with our broadcast. So it, it was just a, a web view that we built into our app um, and our in-game producer um, ended up sliding over and, and we did uh, predictive gaming for our fans. So who will score the next basket? Who, um, Will there be a timeout called before 8.30 on the clock? And we're constantly pushing um, questions to our fans, but uh, with prizes being awarded throughout the game, uh, we effectively broke each game broadcast into six mini games of, of predictive gaming and trivia um, with some, some pretty robust prizing. We had autographed jerseys and, and things that we were giving out. But while we did that, we would also push random participation questions. So um, how are you watching today's game? This would just, we, we had a captive audience and we would push questions um, for data that we wanted for ourselves just to, to better understand the fan base. So how are you watching? Who's your favorite player? How many games have you watched since the NBA came back? Um, have how many games have you been to before do you follow the magic on instagram yes or no so we would just inject those um throughout the game to to better understand our fans and it was it was um a benefit of the platform that we didn't initially see and and as we come back to games we're actually going to expand that um so we'll be doing the second screen platform this season but we'll also be using it in venue to um to let fans engage and help control the game experience. And in doing so, we will do more of that um, polling there and, and data collection there as well. Cool, so you're gonna be doing that. You've got all these insights from the summer with all these different types of content. So after such an unpredictable, unprecedented season, what insights from digital social might you take into 2021 season? And what can you yeah. plan, reveal plans wise? I know everything's still up in the air. I mean, how do you plan when you don't necessarily know whether there's going to be fans there or not? Right. So what I would say, the, the greatest takeaway from COVID, from being in the bubble and an and, and adjustment that we've had to make that I'm sure others have made is the comfort level around the uh, quality of, of content we're willing to output and the quality of content that we're willing to um, put our partners on as well. So, you know, we're, 
we're all doing the best we can remotely and some people have strong equipment some don't players um, are sometimes willing to jump on a zoom call with us but their phones either vertical or they're sitting in front of a window or whatever it is um, so that's a big adjustment that that we made and we're going to be um, mindful and, and okay with going into next season you know I would tell you that um, go, we, we know this is going to be another unique season. It's, it's not going to be the bubble. Um, but you know, we're still trying to figure out a lot. And as the health and safety protocols are put together, um, you know, we'll evolve with it. I think the player access piece, um, is the big question mark now. And, you know, we expect, um, some player access uh as far as as what we traditionally get prior to a season um, but i think what we're going to be um very much working towards is is that um embedded with the team all access um content so uh you know our our goal is to get um jason to to travel with the team to you know if we're if we're saying we're being safe and creating a bubble like atmosphere at all these different venues. It's, it's just the next step of, of what we previously did. So, you know, we, we want to tell the story of another unique season, the best we can from, especially from um, the player's perspective, but also just logistically, I think a lot of people will find it fascinating how some of these things come together um, and, and how, some venues have fans some might not have fans and and there's there are going to be a lot of stories to tell and it's just ensuring that we have somebody with the team to to be there to tell that as as the season goes along there will be a lot of a uh, a lot of first for us as a league so being able to showcase those and and tell the right story is is something we're very much looking for yeah and we're really excited obviously to be part of that and help you tell those stories as well so Thank you very yeah. much, Jeff, for taking the time out for today. It's been really, really fascinating. Could have gone carried on for a long time, and we didn't. There's many areas we didn't touch. Um, so thank you very much for that. If anyone's got any other questions they think of, then do fire them over to my email is on there. So um, maybe we can do an article with Jeff later on if there's a few questions can, come in and put that up on the website. So thank you very much for everyone Absolutely. for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone.